really, but um, Luis Carlos Marquez um, was supposed to be here and uh, just recently had to pull out for health reasons. And so um, he did, though, send his paper, and so I'm going to read his paper. And then since we won't have time for um, question and answer, since I don't really know how to answer the questions that you'll ask, um, uh, Kathy Elias has, um, uh, has stepped forward and is going to present um, uh, the, the mass that um, uh, Dom Helder commissioned and talk a little bit about um, the kind of um, uh, musical and spiritual influences that Dom Helder helped to uh, uh, there. So if you can put up with me talking for a half hour, the real fun then begins when Kathy comes to the uh, podium. Let me just introduce um, Luis Carlos Marquez. He has a doctorate in the history of religions um, from the Università degli Studi in Bologna, Italy. And he's a professor of religious studies at the Catholic University of Pernambuco in Recife, uh, Brazil, teaching in the graduate history program and the postgraduate program. And between 2002 and 2009, he organized the international publication of the complete works of Dom Helder on behalf of the Institute Dom Helder in Recife. He's going to talk a little bit about that in his paper. So without further ado, I, I now become Luis Carlos Marquez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he probably is. He's probably taller and better looking than I am, but what are you going to do? I'm very sorry I'm not able to be here in person, but I appreciate the invitation to take part in this conference about the legacy of Dom Helder Kamara, the sources of future and liberation theology. I'm also thankful for the staff's kindness during the months of preparation, and I apologize for my absence. However, I hope that even from afar, I can contribute to the collective construction of a vigorous synthesis of how much Helder Pessoa Camara, the seminal Brazilian bishop, as the organizers so appropriately called him, put into motion the liberationist paradigm of thought and action that continued in Latin America and can continue to inspire collaborative theology today. In order to do that, I think it's fair that I make two preliminary observations. First of all, I am not a theologian. I am just an historian who has been dedicating himself to research about the impact of beliefs and religious organizations, mostly the Roman Catholic Church, in contemporary Brazilian society. This dedication of mine is the reason why I was invited back in 2001 by the organization now called Instituto Dom Helder Camara, in Recife to propose and then start the execution of a project aiming to gather information, identify, classify, and evaluate the corpus of Dom Helder's writings. This includes manuscripts, some, original type, some originals typewritten and signed, authentic copies of original material which have been lost, already published material, papers, etc. His writings would be published in the editorial format of Obras Completas, according to the historical critical method, with no hagiographic intention, he adds. Not by luck, but by providence, the main promoter of this initiative was Father Jose Comblin, whose importance to liberation theology is well known. At the beginning of 2001, when coming back from a trip to San Salvador, Comblin brought to Recife, besides the collection of obras completas of Monsignor Oscar Romero, the belief that it was time we started to prepare Dom Helders, who had died in August of 1999. Father Comblin anticipated that the publication of Dom Helder Kamara's writings would respond, quote, to the aspirations of all those who care about the future of Christianity and the Church, and are convinced that the life and ministry of Dom Helder are a great sign of the times. They showed the path of Christianity into the new world which is being built, end quote. The second preliminary observation is attached to current times. On May 27, 2014, the present Archbishop of Olinda and Recife, Dom Fernando Severido, with the support of the Brazilian Episcopate, and having in sight the new springtime which has come to the Catholic Church under Pope Francis, signed a request to the Congregation of Saints' Causes, pleading for authorization to open the diocesan phase of the process of Dom Helder's beatification and canonization. Still waiting for Rome's answer, 
Don Saborito, driven by unwavering trust in Providence, had the initiative to name on August 28th the Commission of Experts in History and chose me as president. This post imposes on me some precise restrictions, though. According to the Apostolic Constitution, Divinus Perfectionis Magister, once the process begins, all documents pertaining to the case must be kept secret no longer to be the subject of any publications until the process is conclusion. This canonical injunction will directly affect the publication process of the Obras Completas in its current phase, and therefore my career as an historian considered expert on Heldarian questions. I will allow myself then to make a brief synthesis of the current state of the archival sources, which during the last years have come to surface, and of the situation of the ongoing work of publication so that I can develop the main thought of this presentation. Letters written to his family, family in quotation marks, in Rio de Janeiro was the subject of the first public publishing stage. It consists of 2,234 letters or circulares from the period of 1962 to 1982. This corresponds to the four periods of the Second Vatican Council and a short trip to Rome in March 1964, when Dom Helder, participating in the meeting of the commission in charge of the famous Schema 13, later Gaudium et Spes, received the news of his transfer from Auxiliary Archbishop of Rio de Janeiro to Archbishop of Olinda e Recife. The second stage ga gathered the 309 circularis, or letters, that Don wrote from Recife to his team from Rio de Janeiro from 1964 and 1965. Subsequent stages brought the other 375 post-conciliar letters from August 1967 to the beginning of 1970. The full amount of these 1,259 letters composed of 4,790 handwritten pages and occasional incorporated documents resulted in 5,266 printed pages, including introductions, prefaces, and indexes. At the moment, the letters that are being transcribed are the last 975 that Dom wrote from 1970 to 1982, whose handwritten pages and occasional incorporated documents total 3,657 images. To this already huge corpus of documents of primary importance, we can add an infinity of other handwritings, most of them preserved at the Centro de document, Documentation Hel Helder Camara, but other ones stored in several archives of different names, different natures, and different places. They are, for example, letters he had sent to people he trusted and kept by them, retreat schemes, other projects, official correspondence sent to and received from the Roman Curia, speeches, his meditations and poems, his radio presentations, okay. and the innumerable notes he used to have been asked to speak more slowly. Right? <laughs> uh, for the sake of the translation, um, but maybe also for the sake of, of all of you as well. And the innumerable notes he used to make in the margins of the pages of books he read and that have alone been the subject of a master's degree dissertation. Somebody did a master's degree just on the notes that he wrote in the margins of books. Now, the situation of his publications gives us some questions to be elucidated. The first question would be, why the process of publishing the main documents, carrying his reflections, the letters of circularis, was interrupted precisely on one dated January 25th, 1970. In that letter, Dom Helder claimed as completed an important step in the mission he had given himself during the Council, to be at the service of the Council's effective and efficient reception, not only in the Church of Olinda and Recife, and Recife or Brazil, but in the Universal Church. We can also ask why he opened, purposefully from that date, a new stage, perhaps the most fundamental of his thought, which he called Action for Justice and Peace, AJP, and that we will only fully understand and follow with the publishing of the remaining letters. The precise moment when this evolution of his Episcopal and prophetic teaching comes to the surface is in the special circular he sent, sent from Rome, composed January 24, 1970. In it, he notes, quote, Will AJP rise on an international level? 
The idea came to me in Montreal while facing the third or fourth interview of the trip. A journalist asked me to speak of my movement, Action for Justice and Peace. I explained then that the movement is not mine. It is not related to a person, a country, a political party, or a religion. I reminded her how in all countries, alongside an inert middle and minorities of extreme left and extreme right that collide and plunge into violence and hatred, alongside those there are Abrahamic minorities hoping against all hope. Abrahamic minorities who believe in the power of truth and love and are willing to act to discover the paths of righteousness as a condition to peace. The problem is to discover and encourage the Abrahamic minorities around the world and connect them to each other, trying to see if there is still time to save the world from hatred, fire, catastrophe, death. Don then concludes, quote, the letter to the Holy Father was written, also written inside my head and inside my heart was the book that would release the AJP in its international dimension, all depending on Monday's audience, end quote. Professor Zildo Rocha, while commenting on this passage, claimed that, quote, it was vital that efficient means were found to open in both Brazilian and Latin American societies way, way, ways to true peace. Among the means that Don Helder would explore in the next decade were the movement of world public opinion and the peace and justice action movement. And thus was being completed the evolution of the third phase of Don Helder's thought. As he declared in his autobiographical interview with a French journalist, he had moved, quote, from Plinio Salgao's integralist action to the integral humanism of Jacques Maritain from integral humanism to the integral development of Father Louis-Joseph jo Lebray and Francois Ferrou. So second movement and then the third stage, from integral development to liberation theology of the marginalized and impoverished. On the first phase, we have another testimony from Helder himself, then a simple priest, who in a manuscript of 1943 revealed, quote, do not rely on any reputation of goodness that perhaps I have. I have lived among simple people who call the priest holy as long as he lives close to the people and has charity. No promises to me. Pray for me, yes. Help me move from purgatory to heaven. But I perpetrated, as far as I know, three sins against the priestly spirit. A, I made myself a politician. B, I made myself a bureaucrat. C, I set up a home. And then he goes on analyzing the first of these sins, making himself a politician. And he says, it seems strange that I have been a politician and was affiliated to a party of fascist ideology, Brazilian fundamentalism. Everything was simpler than it may seem today. Let me just interject a, a, a little word of explanation there. Um, Dom Helder in the 1930s joined the Brazilian Integralist Action. It was a fascist party founded in 1932 by Plinio Salgado. It wasn't racist in the way that fascist parties in Europe were, but it believed in a struggle of spiritualism versus materialism. So Catholicism was enlisted versus the materialism of both liberal capitalism on the one hand and communism on the other hand. So Catholicism was to be reinforced by an authoritarian state. And, and that's one similarity with fascist movements in, in Europe. So he continues, I found myself in full struggle when the integralist Brazilian movement emerged. I highlight this fact because there is a huge difference between finding yourself in the middle of a crowd or within the four walls of an office. If I were in the office, I would have looked that way at the nationalist and corporatist reaction against the excesses that had become the idea once generous and pure of liberalism. If I were away from the need to express a public opinion, I would have seen the exaggeration at which authoritarian states were to arrive. Because I was right along the side of the common people, I had to give a public opinion. 
I saw everything that I would have seen in the office. However, I had to choose what, at the time, seemed like a lesser evil. Now, writing these words at a young age, in 1943, he was still just 34 years old. He also makes another statement showing a free spirit. Able to see the essence behind the contingent forms, courageously facing barriers that history itself, training, and social place inevitably imposed on him. Quote, when speaking to ignorant and simple people, I would reduce communism to an enemy of God, homeland, an enemy of God, homeland, and family. But communism in reality is a much more complex movement. I feel more like a brother to the communists, with their excesses, but with their thirst for social justice and the revolt against the exploitation of the poor, than to the cocky bourgeois, insensitive and cold, anti-Christian par excellence. That was the first phase. Regarding the second phase, then, during which he consecutively held the permanent secretariat of the Brazilian Catholic Action in the 1940s, he helped to create and organize and make active Salem, the Council of Catholic Bishops of Latin America, in the 1950s. He created the San Sebastian Crusade and the Bank of Providence in Rio. And he prepared intensely for the Council we have a huge amount of unpublished manuscripts, including a letter he wrote to the newly elected Pope John XXIII, proposing to him a trip to Brazil to inaugurate Brasilia and preside over a large assembly in which were gathered presidents, including Eisenhower, and bishops throughout the Americas, where there would be launched a major program of continental development. Let's go back to the problem. The third phase was the most combative of Dom Helder, during which his prophecy shone, and more and more he was viewed with suspicion, whether by the government of General President Emilio Medici, or by important characters of the Roman Curia. The problem is that because the documents for understanding this third stage are not published yet, and because of the rules which limit my ability to use unseen material, the evolution of the dog, his dreams, his fears, his disappointments, cannot be fully revealed yet. Yes, fear. Yes, disappointments. Helder, who relied a lot on the approval and the support of his friend from the early 50s, Giovanni Battista Montini, Pope Paul VI, found himself increasingly abandoned. Father Hernani Pinheiro, recalls a passage contained in the 43rd Circular, written February 18, 1966, whose significance takes on a concrete form in the 70s. The story of a leper who went to visit the dog when he still lived in the palace of Manguinhos, and embracing him, told him, quote, I came here to bring a message to you. All is dark. All is dark but don't lose your courage." End quote. Later, the Dom pondered, quote, to me, darkness could only come if there were a storm of faith, or if I lacked the support of the Holy Father. Thankfully, there is no sign of it, but anything can happen, End quote. And something did start happening in the 1970s. His friend, the Pope, became distant, hard to reach. Perhaps the small northeastern archbishop bothered him. Or maybe the problem was the powerful people who surrounded the Pope. Those powerful people had good relations with the dictatorial government, which are now surfacing with the research of the Truth Commission, and they didn't want the Pope to see him. The truth is, Dom Helder started to become bitter and critical. In the 66th circular from the new phase, now titled Opening of AJP for the World, written in Recife in June of 1970, he unloads his heart. Quote, Peter, you know how I speak. You know I speak with infinite love for the Holy Church. But is it or is it not true, as the Master taught, that only the truth shall, set, shall free us? What do you think of the Church as you see it right now? I know it has lived incomparably more serious and sad days. 
For example, when simony and corruption of manners at the level of the hierarchy and the Pope didn't quite wipe it out because of the promise that the promise of Christ sustained it. But is it not serious or sad that we are so attached to bureaucracy? And how can the Holy Father, without hurting the truth, say that the church has been rich but no longer is? Is it or is it not serious that the Holy Office continues with a different name but the same spirit? Is it sad to see the Pope giving the impression of permanent anxiety, absence of inner peace, a lack of confidence in the bark of Peter, your bark, as if the Master wasn't in it? It is in this growing anxiety that we can situate the poem which helped me formulate my presentation's title. I dreamed that the Pope went crazy. And he himself was setting fire to the Vatican and to St. Peter's Basilica. Sacred madness. Because God fanned the fire. The firefighters tried in vain to extinguish it. The Pope, crazy, wandered the streets of Rome saying goodbye to the ambassadors accredited to him. Throwing the tiara and the Tiber, giving to the poor all the money in the Vatican Bank. What a shame for Christians. For a Pope to live the Gospel, we would have to imagine him in complete madness. poem he wrote in 1974. To the disappointment with the permanence in his beloved church of structures of power, domination, and alliance with the powers of the world, we must add in those years the clear perception that it was no longer possible to justify alliances with power. Recalling his friendship with Juscelino Kubitschek, president of Brazil from 1956 to 1961, at the time of Kubitschek's death, which was presented as an accident, Dom Helder reflects, so he's writing in 1976, um, at Kubitschek's death, quote, it was only after yesterday's Holy Mass at about 7 a.m. that I heard of the disaster which rendered barely recognizable the body of President Juscelino on the day before. He symbolized an entire phase of my life. The first time I learned of his dreams was when one of his advisors, still in the phase of electioneering, told me about the scene where Juscelino's goals for his government and the developmental slogan, 50 years in five, were presented to him. It was my first encounter with the myth of development. Populorum Progressio, which created the Commission for Justice and Peace desired by Vatican II, argued that to be authentic, the development should be integral, that is, to promote every man and the whole man, is from March 26, 1967. Six months after the opening of Vatican II, Pope John published Pachem and Terrace. Shortly after that came Gaudium et Spes. Even though these great moments in the life of the Church came after the goals of our developmental president, the goals were directly ours, applied to Brazil. End quote. So in just three paragraphs, following a line of reasoning that emotion probably didn't allow to be worded more clearly, Dom Helder paid, in my opinion, one of the most extraordinary tributes to the memory of Juscelino Kubitschek, recognizing one of the main features of the Brazilian politician to be able to anticipate his time, to dream big, and bring together the energies of a nation in a fruitful direction. I say this because I know that for Dom Helder, the Council and its founder, John XXIII, were always above any possible comparisons. But he concludes, quote, and then I believe naively that they would matter to the development of the whole country and all Brazilians. It was the golden time of my dream of direct collaboration between church and state. I only need to recall the famous meetings of the bishops of the North, Northeast with the personal, president of pres the personal presence of President Juscelino at the closure. Only then I realized how the harnessing of the church's car to the state's car 
gave legitimacy to a whole socio-economic pseudo-order that was and continues to be a stratified disorder. End quote. It's a perfect conclusion which no good liberation theologian would After all is said and done, who was Dom Helder? This question posed by Eduardo Hornard and his, his subsequent reflection allowed me to conclude my presentation. I advanced in the title of this paper the assumption that between Dom Helder's theological and political pondering, even in its most difficult phase in the 70s, and the pondering of theologians, philosophers and historians directly emphasized what we know as the theology of liberation. There were agreements and disagreements. I believe he was not, nor did he intend to be, a liberation theologian, in the sense that this qualification may or could be applied to a Carlos Mesters, Clodo Bisboff, Elsa, Elsa Thomas, Rebeto, Leonardo Boff, etc. That is, for many reasons. Because he was from another generation, because of his theological training at the Prynia Seminary, because of his readings, because of his vitality, because his vitality was already declining when this new way of doing theology began to become significant. Only the complete knowledge of all his writings may allow up safer conclusions. However, Hornart also reaches this conclusion and assigns the unique intellectual independence of Dom Helder to his need for absolute political independence. Quote, whenever he felt he was being manipulated in one way or another, the bishop pulled back. He had that very standoffish way of Sarah, where is he from? How do you say it? Sarah. 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 Which might be an indigenous heritage. Freedom above all. Freedom above all. I could personally verify it at a discrete distance before church initiatives such as meetings of the base ecclesial communities, liberation theology, the mass of the quilombo, which is what Kathy's going to present to us, and many other initiatives universally applauded at the time. This was part of his personality and caused awkwardness, even among his closest collaborators. Gifted with an acute, intuitive intelligence, the Dom saw afar and fled from, fled from, clear and precise ideas, from dogmatism and peremptory statements, end quote. At the same time, both from Sierra and Cosmopolitan, the independence cultivated by Dom Helder could only persist because the human being in Helder not just the Catholic Archbishop, was able to engage in self-criticism regarding his choices and beliefs. In addition to his three phases of thought, from fascism to integral humanism, from integral humanism to integral development, and from integral development to a theology of liberation, Helder Camaro was self-critical in all of his vigils, his times of prayer and reflection from 2 to 4 a.m. Every night, 2 to 4 a.m. He never slept, and that's why he wrote so much and did so much. Exactly between day and night, between the open hours, as it is said in Brazilian popular Catholicism, Helder Camara acknowledged the complexity of human life and of the social fabric, and the impossibility of unrestricted adherence to any hegemonic paradigm, even if that was the paradigm of liberation theology. Maybe that is the biggest lesson that the Helderian writings bring to the analysis of the sources and future of liberation theology. It is that it is necessary to review what happened and then do better the next day. Someone who is able to support fascism, developmentalism, and the theology of liberation in one lifetime teaches us that we must revise our sources and use them the next day without sectarianism, without proselytism, without partisanship, and without intransigence. Don Helder teaches us that we must be different every day to remain the same. Let me conclude by recalling one last word of Jose Conklin, which he often repeated. Quote, I am one of those who are convinced that the writings of Dom Helder will still be a source of inspiration in Latin America in a thousand years. 
I mean, he sowed seeds designed to produce an abundant harvest in this new era of Christianity that is starting now. If subsequent conversions signal in some way the future trajectory of the church in this new era of human history. Kalman expected me to contribute to the preservation of these writings and their correct disclosure. Throughout these years, even though I've been driven away for professional reasons from daily living with the tasks of the Instituto Don Helder, I try to contribute so that the processes which will lead to the full publication of the writings of the Dom could go on. Now, with the invitation of Dom Fernando and the challenges of the beatification and canonization process, I hope to complete this mission. <laughs>